Welcome back to Adventures in Blockchain. So I'm Gregory, and I've got my co-panelist here, Roman Storm, today to uh, talk about Ethereum Classic with Zach Belfer. Uh, so Zach's here today from Ethereum Classic, and he's going to tell us about how he got into blockchain. You know, tell us about Ethereum Classic, what they're doing right now, and what the future of blockchain technology is. All right. So welcome to the podcast today, Zach. Ah, thank you for having me. Much appreciated, Gregory. Uh, yeah. To, uh, chatting. yeah. 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 You and me both, man. So, um, Zach, before we get started, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about, you know, for people who don't know, uh, you know, what is Ethereum Classic? What are you working on? What's your involvement? And we'll kind of go from there. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah. So, what is Ethereum Classic? Uh, Ethereum Classic is a, um, you know, version of Ethereum. Uh, it's, a uh, it's the original Ethereum, hence the name Ethereum classic, though that might be, uh, you know, met with some resistance, <laughs> um, but it, it was born out of, um, I guess a, a fundamental ideology, um, which is that the, the developers and maintainers of a blockchain should not interfere with, with, uh, you know, basically the happenings of the blockchain. So, so if somebody were to make a contract and, uh, and, and there would be some catastrophic failure in that contract, it's, you know, it's, it's my personal belief that, that we shouldn't make any changes to the code in order to revert such changes or, or in order to effectively give refunds, you know? Um, and so that's sort of how Ethereum Classic was born a few years back. I don't have the date up exactly, but, um, a couple of years back, um, there was a, a something called a DAO, like Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Uh-huh. And that was a, uh, it was a smart contract that people get to uh, you know, deposit their Ethereum and vote um, on a plethora of things. And somebody had discovered a bug in the contract and was able to drain the contract of all of its well, uh Maybe not all of it's Ethereum, um, but certainly lots of it. <laughs> Enough to scare a lot of people. <laughs> I can't really remember uh, exactly the figure. Yeah, it was it was like pretty devastating, right? And uh, enough so uh, to you know merit some discussion over like, well, is it good for the net? If it, is it good for Ethereum? Is it good for the Ethereum network for us to just like, sorry, can't do anything, um, and you know, that was obviously heavily contested and debated. Um, and yeah, one camp decided that the, the right thing to do uh, was to, uh, yeah, like create a, um, a hard fork and, and uh, undo the transactions effectively that, that uh, caused the DAO, the DAO issues. And, and many people, um, Though it seemed to be the minority of people uh, decided to support with the, like by way of spending time um, supporting uh, uh, the main the maintenance of the original chain. So so without the hard fork that would revert the transactions, right? Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. So so that's sort of that's that's how Ethereum Classic was born, more or less. Um, the I think it was like it was. Some would say it was really made official by the fact that Poloniex listed ETC ticker, and then, uh, and then I guess yeah, that sort of started like a chain reaction, right? Because like all the exchanges were like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like it, it wasn't a thing yet, right? Nobody had that hadn't happened. A chain, it was the first chain split, right? So yeah, a lot of exchanges learned a lot. You know, a lot. Of, uh, oh man, the the stuff that happened afterwards was uh, just unbelievable. So like in the first little while, there was no, there was no cross chain replay protection. So, <laughs> so a transaction, like it was on the node operator to implement uh, ensuring that they're speaking with the right network. So Bitfinex got absolutely spanked by it. Like in the, first couple months yeah i don't know i don't know uh like it, it was so long ago and i remember like um bitfinex like 
amortizing the loss across all of their customers. And I can't remember if that was specifically for this one or not, but, um, <laughs> but, but what effectively happened is you could deposit Ethereum Classic um, or, or deposit Ethereum and withdraw it as ETC. And oh, the, wow. So, like, they're just double, like, yeah, you're like double spending on exchanges, right? <laughs> um, that was like the big first, like the first big, uh, like crazy thing that happened, um, and that was fixed. Uh, yeah, later on with uh, adding um, uh, like chain ID, I think was the solution to that. Yeah, totally. That's um, so funny. That reminds me of uh, I saw something come up on Twitter maybe recently. It was a video of like uh, this armored car that had like blown open on the freeway and had been driving for forever. And all this money was just like littered all over the interstate, and people had like pulled over and were just like grabbing cash. That's what it makes me think of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, well, like for sure, the people that knew that that was a thing. You know, maybe some of them try like, you know, obviously some of them pulled it off or tried to pull it off. And like, I don't know, I, I, don't know, I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> they got they got big tentacles. They'll find you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. So, 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 sorry. Yeah. So, Zachary, Zachary, could you tell us a little bit what do you do right now? What sort of role you're um, you're holding at Ethereum Labs? Yeah. So, um yeah, I work with Ethereum Labs, uh, ETC Labs. Sorry, ETC Labs Core is the, is the <laughs> of our team officially. Um, ETC Labs is a, a startup incubator in San Francisco. Um, they focus primarily on blockchain startups uh, and once again, primarily on Ethereum classic based ones. Um, so they take strong preference to to startups who are who are building on top of Ethereum Classic, and so they just finished. I think their second, first or second cohort. They're starting a new core ho- cohort um, coming up in the next. I think probably few months it'll be announced. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I don't really know exactly the terms of the deal that they offer people, but it's something structured. It's structured like most incubators. They'll take a percentage of your comp- of your of your startup. Um, they invest in uh, they invest in very early stage companies. So like, you know, from people right out of a hackathon to um, you know professional you know developers or whatever quitting their jobs to start something else kind of thing. Really across the board, and uh, and yeah, they set you up with the office space that they have there. Um, and, um, they put you in contact with, you know, me and other people on, on the ETC labs core team, um, to try to like, and to just be there to answer any questions that you have about, you know, problems you're running into. And if we can help then we can help. And, and ETC labs core, um, is a sort of sub team of ETC labs and, we're, we most of us were formerly from ETC Dev, which um, which was a dev team based on um, building a number of things. Um, one of which is just maintaining the Go Ethereum client. Like most of the yeah, totally. You maintain that. So yeah, uh, yeah. So we moved from ETC Dev to ETC Labs Core. Uh, and we're the team that provides a lot of, you know, um, help and consulting, if you will, to the startups, um, all the while um, receiving funding ourselves from ETC Labs to, um, to, to build some projects to help the development of, of these startups. Um, so it's quite nice. We have this like little feedback loop where, you know, we, we can pretty quickly try to solve certain problems and um, and deliver them to people uh, that we you know have the ability to talk to and and find out how it's working for them and adjust yeah and we've been sort of working very much from like the from the ground up uh, I guess you could say um, whereas at DTC dev um, and working on the emerald platform uh, I'll get to that in a minute it was uh, we, we tried to like you know do like have like breadth before depth is I think the best way to explain that, you know, we sure. try to have all the features, um, but not necessarily very well, like polished or, or, you know, with that, you know, be, um, 
developing these features with that mindset of like, I'm, I'm okay with it not being perfect. I just want it to work. Um, mm-hmm. And we found ourselves getting to this point where um, we have like so much code and so many like just hacks on hacks on hacks that it, it just, it's so unwieldy to maintain for one, but two, it, I mean, it failed the ultimate goal, which was to try to hopefully make this stuff more approachable to the common developer, really. Mm-hmm. Sure. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I, I remember there were some funding issues with the Ethereum yeah. lab, and uh, which led to Igor Artomonov uh, resign from the company. I'm curious, who's funding right now the ETC Labs Core? Uh, ETC Labs core, yeah, is like funded by ETC Labs itself. Um, okay. Yeah. And then ETC Labs is a company that is owned by um, uh, DFG, which is Digital Finance Group. Mm-hmm. Uh, a group based out of China. Um, and they invest in, well, they, yeah, I mean, they have many businesses. Uh, ETC Labs is like a very small part of that sort of I see. group of stuff. Do, do you know what happened? In like, uh, yeah, I mean, more or less, like it was, it's like, it, it's obviously very dramatic, right? And right. It, involves, it involves like real people that, you know, at risk of throwing anybody under the bus, I'll spare some of the, some of the details. Sure. But um, effectively, uh, ETC Dev was funded originally by many different sources and I myself uh, know of only a few really and um, it's pretty clear that DFG was probably funding them at some point um, and I guess that I guess it was that uh, it was felt that ETC dev wasn't going in the right direction or or you know at the right speed or whatever um, and so they wanted to uh, I guess I guess DFG decided to kind of create their own team uh, and and basically, you know, ETC Dev was no longer receiving funding from DFG, and so uh, Igor and and um, and friends, you know, started going out and f- trying to find more funding. Um, but it was just the, the like timing wise. I mean, to to do a proper fundraising round, you you can't do it in months in a month, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> not talking about something that takes weeks. It's, right. It's, you know, it's a, you need, like getting it done in six months would be incredible, really. <laughs> right. Incredible. So it's, it just really was sort of the end of that. And, uh, and it was kind of a point where we had, like our whole team has the opportunity to go and do the same stuff, possibly, restarting or or throwing out the things we don't like and doing it over but just with a different company and so though it was pretty contentious uh eventually a lot of us moved and like just ended up working at ETC labs for until today and now we have pretty i would say like 60 percent of the etc dev team is working at etc labs core now uh, oh wow! And at one point it was more, but yeah, a couple people have moved on since then. So um, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, oh. yeah, sure. So I have another question. So one of the weak points that I personally see as a developer is that there are top Ethereum tool providers such as Infura, MetaMask, Etherscan. So I I believe like. If those, you know, leaders in the Ethereum ecosystem could support Ethereum Quasi, that would give the huge boost to the Ethereum Quasi as the platform for building apps. So why do you think it still didn't happen? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I like, well, I, I guess it's a question of motivation, right? Like, I don't really know why Infura would really care to add Ethereum Classic because it would be an expenditure for them. And as far as I know, none of these platforms are generating revenue. So like it would just be a pure loss for them. And 
even though it might bring a certain set of customers in or new users. Um, maybe I'm, I'm assuming that they have other features that are just higher value. That's all. But has anybody reached out to them to maybe offer some funding for their expenses so they can support if you're going to As far as I know, I don't think so. But that certainly is a good idea. Yeah, I'll probably I'll, I'll, I'm going to write that down. Because, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like it, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I don't see why they, why they wouldn't just run, like allow you to run an ETC node. It's the same thing, really. Like you could say, for example, we have um, a couple guys that work on ETC put together. Excuse me. Um, it's called MultiGeth. Mm-hmm. And so what it is, is it's like, it's a maintained fork of Go Ethereum, like not Ethereum Classic Go Ethereum, but just regular Ethereum Go Ethereum. And what it does is it's, it, it applies a configuration layer on top of it so, so that you can basically like feature flag EIPs and ECIPs and whatever improvement proposals for any network. So the idea is you can use this one client and depending on the way you configure it, uh, uh, you can run it for ETC, you can run it for Ethereum, you can run it for, there's a, you know, there's a couple other ones in there. I don't really remember, but yeah. Um, so that's, it's pretty cool. And using that, you know, one could set up something like Infura that supports all Ethereum based networks very simply. Right. Um, and for, for me personally, like the, like a, a, a big a big thing that my team's working on uh, is called uh, Service Runner, or like Jade Service Runner. Jade is a platform, like you know, suite of tools that we're putting together. Um, but yeah, the Service Runner is a it's a programmatic API for running Go Ethereum client. So think kind of like Kubernetes or or Docker or something like that. Um, but it doesn't. It's not running anything in a VM. And yeah, it it. it it's, it'll have a lot of features. Uh, we can talk about Jade Service Runner a little bit more later. Um, but uh, that's one example of a piece of software that we're putting together in the hopes that the pattern of Infura will dissipate. So, like, the only way, like, fundamentally, the network is stable if there are many nodes, miners or not, right? Even if there are not a lot of miners. Um, and lots of like, you know, more nodes is always better because you get um, better peering between nodes. And so information is generally shared across the network faster. It means, you know, less, generally speaking, you know, less uncle blocks and stuff like that. And so, uh, yeah, we, we want to just make it really easy for people to just run nodes themselves, either on Google Cloud, AWS, whatever, because um, certainly that's probably what Infura is doing anyways. Uh, and, and as well as we want to create the patterns so that, um, users of the dApps can run node, a node on their computer, you know, without needing to open a terminal and you, know, you don't need to be a developer kind of, kind of idea. Right. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. So that, uh, yeah, if you're a dApp developer, then you can say in your app, just point them to the to this package and say, okay, go download it and it'll just run in your taskbar or whatever. Uh, and you'll have an Ethereum node there. And now the DAP's just going to hit your own local node. Right. Um, yeah. So like, and this, I guess kind of can all be summarized and it can all come back to like, um, like just sort of trying to ch- like teaching a, Teaching a sort of new paradigm is, I think, really important. Is, is that Infura is there, I would say, because everyone is very used to this idea that you can go in your browser, type in the URL, and start using something, right? And it's not that we don't want to have that. It's just that in order to have true peer-to-peer applications, obviously, you need to uh, circumvent any like you know things that are centralized like DNS for example is always the is always the like common uh, spot that everything gets centralized through right mm-hmm. uh, and so like 
say Infura, if you had decentralized Infura or whatever, well, like it still goes through the Infura DNS stuff. So is that really decentralized? Like, yeah. Not really. I think I think the reason people choose Infura is not because they are you know evil minded they like the centralization I think I think it's because the architectural design of Ethereum mainnet at the moment that it's not you know easy and convenient for developers like just to deploy my contract and have my D app interact with the blockchain I have to wait I don't know how many yeah. days yeah nice true. For the, all this chain and just uh, you know, <laughs> And maintain this uh, really, uh, I mean, not very expensive, but still to some developers, that would be an issue. Yeah. Well, it's expensive in time, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's totally. Like a long time to sync a full node. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to know if, like, if you don't quite see, can provide better benchmarks for uh, chain synchronization. Not really. Not going to lie to you. Yeah. Um, it's not great. Yeah. It, uh, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't fully sank, sunk, synced a full note in, a, in, I don't know, probably like a month or two. I don't really remember how long it takes, but uh, it's, it's in the order of like, you know, half days, so to speak, you know, like half day to a full day to, you know, men, prob- maybe, maybe more, obviously depends on your hardware as well. Right. Like, um, that's the main uh, main force behind Ethereum 2.0 to like provide a sharded blockchain, so you can the sync time could be almost instant. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting proposals coming up um, in order to solve this problem, or or I don't know about solving the problem, but uh, at least address it in a in some type of way. Um, yeah, finding some sort of compromise. Yeah, yeah. The the like light client approach is very popular. You know, like um but it, you know, it's effectively a proxy node, right? Like you, so it it yeah, I mean, it's like it's it's kind of tough, right? It's like saying I want a bicycle that goes 200 kilometers an hour. You know, you, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're you know, we're trying to make steps, but we're not we're also trying not to just com- completely break everything at the same time, right? So there's a lot of yeah, interesting ways that you can potentially reduce the size of the blockchain, um, reduce how long it takes for you to be able to use your node. And I think that creative solutions in that realm are essential, um, but it's also essential for us to maintain that the average and the default is like what will be best for the network first rather than uh, what is easiest for the developer? Um, because you know we can always build tools to make things easier, right? And we can always teach that one, hey, this step, right? And and um, and not have to make such big sacrifices, I guess. But uh, I do have to mention though, um, one of one of the one of the Ethereum Classic folks put together um, a project. Uh, it's called ether cluster yeah so what it is is um it's a repo that has uh what does he use i think he's using terraform uh let's see yeah 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 Terra- i think he's using Terra. yeah terraform to deploy like some a, a kubernetes cluster to a google cloud engine that'll run you um an ethereum rpc backend right so Using that suite of tools, it's fairly reasonable to make a you know high scale sort of something that would be more or less on par with Infura, right? Um, but just host it yourself. To, yeah. Well, I mean, if you wanted to, you could take this and add a add a like a you know login and sign up and billing and yeah, there there you go. Another uh, note as a service platform. <laughs> totally. And so yeah, we, we that. That's sort of the direction that our team personally is like going down, right? Like, we don't want to be the ones making Infura. We want to be the ones making it so stupidly simple for somebody else to make Infura that like that it just happens, right? With this, with like using just the regular tools. Um, yeah, and like a lot of this stuff sort of came out of um, like this earlier project, like right after we moved from ETC Dev to uh, ETC Labs Core. 
the Ethereum Classic network went through a fairly substantial 51% attack. And there was a, there was like, I don't know, like a couple million bucks or something like that that got double spent. Um, and oddly enough, one of the exchanges reported that uh, some people like gave a bunch of it back or something. Oops, didn't mean to double spend. But anyway, uh, yeah, in that time, we were like, everybody's coming to Discord, you know, oh, how are you going to address, how are you going to fix the 51% attack? I mean, it's kind of impossible. So, like, as part of the rules of the network, that whoever has the most hash and like can build the longest chain, that's the, that's the chain. And I mean, the only way to to solve the problem really is to just in, have more hash power and and have more decentralized hash power, like more entities that are providing hash rate. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people think that changing the mining algorithm. Uh, would like deter that that particular fifty one percent attack, but it just sort of opens the door to others as well. So I mean, it's it's tough. Yeah. It, it, so anyway, our approach was to instead of try to stop the fifty one percent attack, really the problem is uh, confirmation times just need to go up. Like if you're a node operator, right? So like I can sort of dive into the whole 51% attack thing. Uh, I would be curious to know if you have any estimates on how much do you think it takes financially to execute a 51% attack? Um, last time I checked, it was like uh, Ethereum Classic has like 4% of the hash rates uh, that Ethereum has. So like, I think, yeah, the, la the last time I checked, it was like Ethereum had 300 Terra hash and Ethereum Classic had like eight to twelve or so. So how much would it cost a fifty-one percent attack? I mean, that's sort <laughs> of a tough question, right? Because there's like a fifty-one percent attack is a is a attack rooted in probabilities, right? So it's like it really you would have to uh, the the question is better framed as how much would it cost to produce um you know n consecutive blocks right because that's effectively what you would need to do in order to uh meaningfully well there's okay yeah there's a, a slight tangent there's a lot of like attack vectors that come out of a 51 percent attack like double spend is one of them and it's obviously the most common one but there's a there's a whole host of things that you could possibly do uh, to degrade the network and you know do other nefarious things, but generally speaking, when when I'm talking about 51% attack, I'm talking about 51% uh, attacks relating to double spend problem, and the, and yeah, so the double spend problem is like an exchange when they receive a deposit, they're going to wait a certain number of confirmations. It's like, well, what is a confirmation? A confirmation is how many blocks have happened since the block that included your transaction. So on Bitcoin, they aim for maximum of three. And uh, they, they, the, the probabilistic finality of a transaction past three confirmations is very high. So what that means is as a exchange operator or node operator or whatever, DAP developer, you can reasonably, reasonably expect that after three blocks, from that transaction, uh, it won't be, it, it, it's, it's final, more or less. But the nature of blockchain, um, specifically proof of work blockchains, uh, and their consensus rule is that the longest chain always wins and there's no exceptions to that. So it, 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 essentially you're, you're calculating the weight of the chain. So it's not necessarily always the longest one, it's like, you know, the heaviest chain that wins. But uh, no, uh, regardless, um, so that means if somebody were to mine in secret and produce a blockchain of say 10 blocks and then hold it all to itself and don't tell anybody, right? Meanwhile, the network's going, people are transacting, you know, exchange gets their three confirmations. They're like, yep, here's your money. And then this secret blockchain, now I broadcast it. I'm like, so every every node in the network sees, oh, I don't have the latest blockchain because this one's heavier. 
okay, drop whatever I had, go to that one now. And whatever you just dropped is now gone, right? That's not part of the blockchain anymore. And only archive, only archive nodes would even actually keep that information around. So like you can't build any protocol stuff on top of that information to resolve if it was like, you know, an attacker chain somehow. It's like, it, it's, it's a very, uh, yeah, it, it's it, at this point, there is no clear solution to, to like knowing or being able to identify that as being malicious. Got it. Yeah. Another question that I have as a blockchain developer, um, I like to see some devs on the on the market just to learn what they've done, how they've done it. And I usually go to like state of the apps or a D app radar. I'm curious if there is anything like that for Ethereum Quasic where you can check what are the top Ethereum Quasic D apps built on Ethereum Quasic. Yeah, there's, there is one, I don't know how active or how, how heavily used it is. I think the Saturn wallet folks maintain it. Um, but it's called, there's one called DAP direct. Yeah. And so they, they list out the sort of the top, top DAPs by contract. I mean, do you personally know any of the D apps that are being actively used, uh, like were being developed on Ethereum Quasi? Um, public ones that are notable. I mean, there's there's some that people use that I don't really agree with, and so I don't really want to talk about them. I see. That's uh, fine. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, there's a few other ones like uh, like Original My. They do some like some identity verification stuff and uh i'm pretty sure that they're doing stuff with like like south american government or something like that i don't know i can't really remember i saw them at a contract um at a, at a um conference once and they were talking about some pretty interesting stuff for like uh government identification and uh like notarizing and and yeah, like decentralized notaries, like that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as uh, other contracts that are really neat these days, um, there's um, there's this one called Metronome that's fairly recently developed, um, and it's basically a it's a, a it's it's a bridge between other ethereum based uh networks so um you know a, a way for you to transfer your ethereum into ethereum classic in a mostly decentralized fashion at least it would be done through a sequence of smart contracts of, and then you know some oracle in the back to, prov to provide price information like you know at what rate to swap ethereum to ethereum classic um, yeah, very cool. Yeah, that one's pretty neat. Uh, there's a couple other sort of down that down that vein, like um, apps around uh, or like dApps for um, uh, yeah, just exchanges basically, or or like um, cross network contract stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot of people that are really hyped on the uh, idea of like blockchain interoperability. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff, and in, in a way, like. I, I've always sort of thought that, in my opinion, you know, that's probably the best way to scale this stuff, actually, is, is actually to just have numerous blockchains that are secured by various mechanisms, right? Um, so, like, Bitcoin uh, has very high hash rates, um, but also, as time goes on, you know, transactions will probably get more and more expensive, right? So then maybe you switch and use a, a cheaper blockchain, but still with some ability to have them interrupt in some way. Um, yeah, so, very cool. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting idea for sure. Yeah. Um, that makes me think of another question, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And well, there's, there's two questions here. You know, you're, you know, you're hinting at essentially where this technology could go, right? With this whole idea of interoperability. So I want to get to that question, but I want to save that for the end. Before we get there, a lot of, you know, 
a lot of people, in addition to knowing where this technology is going to go, they also are kind of curious how they can, um, you know, kind of get into blockchain. Some, some people are already in it, going to be working in it who are listening to this. Some people are checking it out. Maybe tell us a little bit about your story, about how you got into blockchain, you know, briefly, and then maybe some advice for people who are, who are getting into it. You know, what does it mean to be a blockchain developer? What kind of technologies did you learn? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, how did I get into it? Oh, well, I guess like in university, a really long time ago, like Bitcoin was pretty young, you know, like the mm. dollar Bitcoin days kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, myself, just like many others, uh, sort of heard of it and looked at it. Thought it was pretty cool, but like didn't really look into it too deeply, right? Just mm -hmm. okay, that's, that's pretty neat. I tried to make like um, a JavaScript Bitcoin miner, I think was like the first, like that was the first thing I ever tried to do <laughs> to crypto and uh yeah that didn't go so well but anyway yeah, i like you know felt a little bit sour about the years following you know like you know i wasn't really too captivated i guess you could say by bitcoin itself um but more so like as every as a lot of other people just like you know, oh man, I should have just bought it in university. You know, I was <laughs> it was hard to buy back then. <laughs> yeah, well, I, like hard to buy like a bowl of soup, let alone a big thing. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. So uh, many years later, uh, working in a couple different startups. Uh, yeah, like well, like you know, when in university, I went to university for computer science. So after that, got some jobs doing some programming and stuff like that, and I was like. One several years ago, uh, this guy that I was working with, he was like super into crypto, <laughs> and, and every day he'd just tell me about it, and uh, and that was like right, bef that was like maybe like four or five months before uh, the Ethereum ICO. Okay, and he was like telling me about, oh yeah, I'm like buying this ICO, like it's so tight, you gotta check it out, Ethereum, change the world. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, and uh, and the one thing actually that that roped me in was um, for like the longest time, like since I was a kid, you know, I always thought like trading was so cool, you know, like, oh, uh -huh. man, you know, get all those charts and oh man, like imagine applying programming to, to it and all this stuff, right? And anyway, I, I thought it was really cool, and and I had forayed many times into trying to set up like an api token and stuff like that with an exchange and try to like do some stock trading uh programmatically and there was like i, I was just met with like disappointment every time right? like <laughs> it was like okay i get to a certain point it's like hey now you now you get to deposit 100 grand <laughs> you know, like, yeah <laughs> uh and so when i like my buddy Greg was telling me about all this crypto stuff and he was like showing me like, oh yeah, you can like trade 200x leverage. And I'm like, what the hell is that even? <laughs> um, and, and he was showing it to me and uh, it looked really cool. And then he was telling me about how, yeah, there's like an API. And, and then so I went home and checked it out and I was like, holy crap. And so I, that was like really the first thing I, uh, I sort of semi-successfully put together that was I, I suppose crypto related was just like trading bots, man. It had nothing to do with crypto, really. Like I wasn't touching the blockchain. I wasn't doing any of the transactions, but uh, it was it was a thing that enabled me to mess around with trading, which is something I wanted to do for a really long time. And um, yeah, and then from there, uh, I joined like a couple Slack groups and stuff like that. Um, and this one particular one was very captivating to me um, because they had this like tip bot in Slack where you would be able to type like bot balance and it was essentially a wallet, but in a Slack bot and you could send shit to each other. And I thought like, oh, that's a cool idea. Like I'm going to build that for, work. you know, like little MySQL database or whatever, you know. Um, and then, you know, I started to learn more and realize that like, holy crap, like, you can see this shit in explorers. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so that opened my mind a lot to this stuff. And 
and then uh and i decided that i would like to uh try to like contribute in some way right um like by way of of building like something that actually uses the blockchain itself rather than like uh you know building against some platform that uses it underneath right and so a friend of mine and i uh embarked on this journey of building a wallet for a uh well actually we found uh like one one of the friends that i had made in one of these slack groups like they were looking for a bitcoin wallet uh or like they were looking for somebody to build them a bitcoin wallet uh or like a bitcoin based wallet right because it was like some shit coin that was like a fork of bitcoin um but there was no wallet for it so yeah and we told them, all right, well, like, let's build a let's build a, a wallet that'll run in the browser where your keys would be stored in local storage and all that stuff. And yeah, so that that really got us got me into got me into blockchain stuff because then yeah, you know, I started really learning more about the fun, like how it you know how to put together a transaction. Really, that like that is a super good thing for somebody to learn early on um, yeah totally there, there was some html5 uh, browser i'm curious if it were, was you like it was like cyberpunk or i don't i don't remember the name no no not me uh, <laughs> yeah it uh like the the crypto like the shit coin or whatever that it, that it was for was like mainly based out of spain um it was called Sarcoin, and the the developer that that built it, um, like he's he's an awesome dude. Uh, his name like Luke something, can't remember. But um, he's working on Quark now. I think I don't know if you ever heard of that one, but anyway, uh, yeah, it was it was really it was really interesting, good experiment, um, and you know, let me apply the knowledge that I already had as well as learn some new things right like i already knew how to build you know react apps and mm -hmm. you know like the common you know i i call it you know the rails developer you know toolkit right like <laughs> that by rails like like well that's pretty much what this was like, it should yeah it's totally look through right and and yeah it was just really really cool and that sort of led me down the path of of building as as many things as I really could. Uh, meanwhile, like mind you, I, I still had a job at that point, like a regular job or whatever. Um, so it was all very much side gig, you know, pastime sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then last year, I I was it last year? Yeah, about a year, year and a half, I think, about a year and a half ago. Um, I got the um, one of my friends, uh, like really good friend that I worked with um, previously at at a company called Battlefy, um, he messaged me and he's like, "Oh yeah, like somebody, he he's applying for this job on on with ETC Dev." And I'm like, "Oh okay, that's like kind of interesting." And sort of talked about like, "Well, why ETC Dev and uh, like why ETC, right?" Um, and it was like a mix. Any, anyway, like he he got the job and um and he was like sort of just telling me about it and what sort of stuff he's working on and obviously i was like super jealous somewhere <laughs> from like marketing software and like, like ssl provisioning stuff and just like so dry and so i was like yeah okay like well i'll apply like i'll come work with you and um and yeah i ended up getting the job it took like forever because you know, a common trend in the crypto world seems to be like disorganization. But <laughs> yeah, I got the job and the thing that they were working on when I started was this wallet, like Emerald wallet. Um, and it was like, it was pretty much in, it was pretty much in shambles. Like it didn't really work at all. Um, and so that's what I worked on for the most part for like, uh, about like a month or two just to get it to like a release releasable thing and then after that started uh doing as i mentioned earlier like taking that breadth approach um and building out 
a bunch of tools that we saw had a like seemed to have a place in this world like um uh like a cli for a bunch of stuff like a cli to sort of not necessarily compete but uh be similar to what you would get from from truffle uh cli so Very cool. ability to boot up a test net ability to start up you know an explorer or start up a wallet or start up um or like create a new project so we had like um emerald starter kit which is sort of analogous to uh create racked app um and would just give you a bootstrapped it was a to-do app where the 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 to-do items are stored on the smart contract and you know all the codes there sort of thing so it's, it's effectively like here's cred you do whatever you want now right? <laughs> um, yeah and so yeah that it was it, it was pretty cool and we got to a pretty good point with it um and then the whole etc dev fiasco thing hit and we had to pack up shop <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it seems like etc dev and igor and whoever else like yuri uh like i that's how i don't think that's his real name but <laughs> Like, come on, his name can't really be Yuri Gagarin. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he's working on, they're still working on Emerald Wallet and it's looking pretty sweet actually. But yeah, like um, to speak to, I think the coolest part or the most important part of the whole Emerald idea um, is to separate transaction signing from Go Ethereum, but still have that similar or yeah, basically have that similar interface, like JSON or PC interface, um, just from a different service, right? Like, so uh, to unpack that, I guess a little bit more. Uh, there's a many different, obviously many different ways that you can create an Ethereum account, account, right? Uh, so probably the most common one that everyone knows is you know, say MetaMask, uh, which is browser extension would use uh would would create an address store the private keys itself um and you interact with it through the metamask api right like mm -hmm. inject web3 or or what have you uh, although you're not doing the injected web3 stuff anymore but that's another. anyway so that's like one way and then another way is say like if you're a miner or like you're uh, operating a mining pool you would use uh go ethereum account like a, an account inside of go ethereum mm -hmm. uh so you'd use like you know like new account or like yeah got personal basically and in order to interact with that you would use json rpc um similar to how you would talk to any like get information from a uh, go ethereum client yeah all information pretty much more or less is acquired through the json rpc interface. yeah like web3 under the hood is basically what's doing yes yes exactly um and so and part of that is like you have to unlock the account and then right when, uh calls to like sign transaction or whatever or sign them all locally right yeah 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 well you're right so yeah that would be like when you say sign them all locally you mean like from the user end yeah yeah so you got to be unlocked on the node or you have to sign every transaction yourself with something like metamask yeah and what the like really what is different there is where is the private key right and so that's sort of what we really wanted to draw attention to and and put emphasis on which is where are your private keys as like a pretty first and fundamental question <laughs> all like answered so with uh like we're trying to um to uh develop and well we have this we have a service and we have the spec we're trying to make it into a real spec um but this idea of having a signer rpc service so a service that would run uh store your private keys and uh, allow you to create new ones and all it would do is just sign transactions and messages and it doesn't it wouldn't it wouldn't talk to the it wouldn't talk to any network at least it'd be completely offline right 
uh, if you want to sign a transaction, you pass in the nonce, you pass in everything that you need to know about the network. Um, wow. And so the idea there is that uh, how, we, how we use that, say, an Emerald Wallet, is Emerald Wallet would just boot up this service, like the signer service, on your machine or what, that, or what have you. But in reality, like that's, that service could be anywhere, right? So say you could have like, uh, you could, you could have like a wallet custodian service sort of thing that just provides this RPC API to you. And so like, oh, my wallet is over at this service. But if, or if you want to store your private keys on your own machine, um, you can run it on your own computer as well. Um, and, and yeah, just really just separating out the signing and sending of transactions into two steps is really the fundamental there, right? Like, not that you can't do it already. Um, it's just making it so that it's the only way in which you do it. <laughs> it's yeah. Just- yeah, very cool. So that's uh, interesting to uh, kind of hear something about, you know, that you guys have on the roadmap for the future. That's awesome. Well, um, before we kind of wrap it up for today, um, if people want to learn more about, you know, what you all are kind of working on in the future, or if they want to, you know, find out more about you, maybe what you're personally working on, you know, can they connect with you all on social media? You have a blog. What's, uh, what's the best way for people to find that information out? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. So you can hit me up there. Belford Z, just my last name, B-E-L-F-O-R-D-Z. Cool. Yeah. I'll put a link to that down in the uh, show notes as well. Um, and yeah, on GitHub, same thing. Uh, you can catch me in the uh, ETC Labs Discord or the ETC Community Discord or, or you know, you can even send me a message on Facebook. And we can be friends. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and then for, for projects, I, I feel like we talked about a lot of very high, like, you know, high in the sky, like high level stuff, but like more specifically things I'm working on, like open RPC and this uh, Jade platform that's intending to be more or less the successor of Emerald. Um, cool. So I'll take all the stuff we learned from building Emeralds and, you know, don't make the same mistakes type of thing and apply them to uh, this new thing called Jade. Um, definitely always looking for contributors and, um, people interested in trying it out it's very early still like i think the service runner first release was put out i think about a month and a half ago so yeah like i said very new still probably the 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 most interesting to me project is open rpc uh and that one we're very much looking for contributors and, uh the intent there is to make a uh it's a for, it's a fork of open api and swagger um repurpose to to complement json rpc so and we have like a collection of client generators documentation generators mock server like auto test coverage tool thing that'll hit all your methods in your api against your examples and make sure that they're all returning proper information yeah it's really cool uh the idea and, and we have a uh, generated ethereum clients now uh it's in multi geth it's we're working on getting it into ethereum uh like go ethereum from the ethereum foundations ethereum. and yeah i got like a bit bitcoin proof proposal together too so we got uh we're starting to put together an api spec definition for bitcoin so all of this the idea is like open rpc you'll be able to generate clients for every every cryptocurrency pretty much um, nice. as well as standardized documentation, uh, which is a huge gap. And the documentation that it would be completely generated. Yay. <laughs> like there'd be one spot to put it and it and you know uh and it's 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 a spec, right? So you like, <laughs> you, you follow the spec and that's sort of the point. Uh yeah. if, if I may pluck one of the coolest features on top of it is this concept of service discovery. So a if you if if you have a server and it's a JSON RPC server, uh, it can implement the service discovery method as described by OpenRPC. And what that does is if I call the method RPC.discover, 
it returns the the service description for itself. So if if I wanted to consume a service, but I don't know anything about it, I can just say call RPC Discover and it'll tell me all of its methods with the schema for all of the parameters and return values. Enough information for you to just interact with the client right away, which is pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. That's awesome, man. So it sounds like you guys got a lot of cool stuff going on and uh, coming out in the future. So everybody, uh, go follow Zach on Twitter, on GitHub, and you know, watch his commit history lit up like a Christmas tree, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, totally. We'll uh, kind of watch some of this stuff materialize into the real world. So I'm excited about you know, somebody who's you know, in the trenches building the future of the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, well, Zach, thanks so much for coming on today. This has been a great chat. Um, you know, it's it's been very educational, uh, very interesting. I'm really glad that we've had you on today. Uh, so thanks, Roman, for putting this together. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we are a blockchain agnostic podcast, so we welcome anyone who wants to talk openly about their uh, tools, about blockchains, or even if it's a little controversial like topics like Ethereum Classic that everybody has been talking about for years. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. Well, thank you guys very much. Thanks, Gregory. Thanks, Roman. Uh, yeah. And yeah, we'll uh, maybe do this again sometime uh, after you guys get a couple under your belt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a plan. All right. Very cool. Well, I'm going to wrap this up for today, guys. Again, check out the uh, podcast description for all the links. I'm going to have Zach drop some in the chat here. So we'll have you all uh, be able to click on those nice and easy. Um, yeah. Check those out down in the description below. And until next time, thanks for listening to Adventures in Blockchain. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly.